Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome, and thank you all for being here. Um, I'm Bruce Matty Weitzman. I was asked to chair this session, and I can't think of anything that gives me more pleasure than to share, chair a session who, uh, uh, in which our, our, the guest, uh, our guest speaker is Professor Kenneth Stein from Emory University and uh, founder and head of the Center for Israel Education. Uh, as uh, some of you know quite well, Professor Stein is a longtime friend uh, and of, the, uh, of Tel Aviv University and of the Moshe Dayan Center. Um, uh, Ken is, has been a mentor, a colleague, and friend of mine going back more than three decades. And for some people here, uh, the relationship goes back even longer. Um, it's uh, great to have you back here uh, at the center. Uh, Professor Stein, for those of you who aren't familiar with his work, uh, is the author of this, uh, I would call it seminal book, The Land Question in Palestine, 1917 to 1939, a book which uh, was published uh, in 1984 and still stands the test of time. It is a, uh, one of the foundational books on the, the entire complicated study. Uh, of the land question. Uh, uh, more recently, uh, he authored this book, I'll pass them around too for people to, uh, to take a look at, Heroic Diplomacy, uh, Sadat, Kissinger, Carter, Begin, and the Quest for Arab-Israeli Peace, um, and uh, a masterful study based on, on, on hundreds of, of interviews with the, uh, uh, from all uh, the relevant uh, parties to the uh, diplomatic process in the uh, 1970s, and uh, uh, Professor Stein has never uh, uh, stopped being interested in that process, and as we'll hear today in his lecture 40 years after Camp David, uh, there's much more to say, uh, and we're, we're looking forward to him sharing that his insights and findings uh, on that subject. Um, again, Ken, welcome, uh, warm welcome to you uh, from your friends and colleagues, and welcome to our, our students uh, as well, uh, for, for whom uh, this will be their first time meeting you. So, you know, you're on the spot now. A lot of good memories uh, from this building uh, from the early 70s when um, Professor Shamir was at the end of the, the hall, running the, uh, the Dayan Center. And since then, um, lots of people have played a role in my life, um, having done advanced graduate work here at the Hebrew University and coming quite frequently to Tel Aviv to meet with people. Um, and then later, as I wrote the Land Question in Palestine book, um, the singular most important person in the Dayan Center who facilitated many, many of the interviews that I did, uh, Amira Margalit, and um, who I think was probably as instrumental as any of the professors that I had in, um, at Michigan or at the Hebrew University who helped me. Um, I'm in grave danger of um, making a presentation to individuals who have studied this or have lived it. Um, and it's the story, of course, as I'm sure many of you have heard, of some geologists being asked to give a lecture on some recent tsunami in Southeast Asia or hurricane in um, the east coast of the United States. And the individual starts speaking about the flood and makes an analogy to the biblical flood and makes some really silly remark to which some man puts his hand up and says, well, that's not exactly right. I'm Noah and I was there. Um, there are people in this country who have greater knowledge than, than I about the topic. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about how I came back to the topic. 
um, and make four general remarks. Many of you are familiar with the history. I'll go through it very quickly with a PowerPoint. But there are four areas that I'd like to uh, address. Uh, the status of current research on uh, the Camp David negotiations. And here I use a very expansive uh, time period of 1973 through 1979 because it was the prelude to um, the Carter administration that set the stone, set the, the stage for uh, Sadat continued to do what he had already done since the middle of the 73 war. Um, so talk a little bit about sources and what's current and why I've come back to it now. Um, what can I say about, or what can we say about um, the Camp David negotiations and what did they accomplish? What, what might we say that they did not accomplish? Um, and what could we then learn from that experience would be prerequisites for successful negotiations. What, what lessons could there um, be learned? When I did this book in um, the 80s and the early 90s, um, after uh, being exposed um, in the 80s to uh, former President Jimmy Carter as an advisor on Middle Eastern affairs, I got to know a lot of the people who had served his administration, um, secretaries of state, diplomats, and then was introduced to a whole series of people who were involved um, in the Egyptian foreign ministry, the Syrian foreign ministry, um, Jordanians, <laughs> And this is a book that was written without too many um, source documents. That is to say, not much material was available when the book was written at the end of the 80s and into the 90s. Most of the materials in the United States had not yet been released. Most of the materials, which later on became what we know is the foreign relations of the United States. And all of this is online for anyone who wants to bury themselves in the minutia of who said what to whom um, and what was not said. And if you're really an, a person who is a source freak and you like sources like you would like chocolate ice cream and chocolate sauce and with raisins and sprinkles on top, then go dive in because you'll never stop reading it. Um, so when much of this material was released, I went back and I looked at what did I say and what kind of assumptions did I make and what would I correct? What was, what was different? You know, I, this was published in 98 or 99. Here we are now 20 years later, so I'm really doing my own revisionist history. I'm sort of taking a look at myself and evaluating my how much did I get right and how much that I didn't? Now, when you interview people, they, of course, have selective memories. They don't want to remember everything. Rarely are they going to tell you something that, where they made a mistake unless you push them. Or they will tell you something very candid because they really want you to walk away with a remark or uh, an idea or a vignette that tells a story that they feel will never get out otherwise. That's the beauty about interviewing people who were participants in a particular process. They feel that somehow the historical evolution of an event was not told appropriate, was not told completely, was told with a particular slant. I'll give you the most dramatic example, was standing in front of Assistant Secretary of State Roy Atherton, who had worked in the Nixon Kissinger shuttle um, worked for Ford as well, worked for Carter. Um, Atherton worked with a guy by the name of Harold Saunders. One was Assistant Secretary of State, one was worked at, at the White House. And Atherton, when I first sat in front of him, I said, Roy, tell me why is it that of all the people who worked in the State Department in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, why did you have this 
sort of special affinity for Israel which the other ones didn't have. Oh, Ken, it's quite simple. My first posting was Dusseldorf in 1945 and I was responsible for Jewish displaced persons and I could never forget what those individuals had to go through. And always that sat with me, so I always understood what Israel had to go through. And even though we thoroughly disagreed with Israel on many occasions, I understood the distance they had traveled. Well, there's a man who served in the bureaucracy for 30 years who has historical context and perspective, which says a lot about people who serve our respective countries is where do they, where do they get their first beginnings? Where do they get their kindergarten training? Where do they learn about their first prejudices? What is the difference between presidents who evolve from being individuals who serve in Washington, Congress, Senate, secretaries in the Navy, head of the CIA, as compared to people who are governors, Reagan, Carter, Clinton, even Trump. Their knowledge or their sensitivities are just not the same. And it has ultimately an impact upon how decisions might be made or who do you rely upon for making decisions. But that's a completely different topic. So then, to my great delight, um, I was here in Israel four or five years ago, and um, I decided that I was going to go to the Israel State Archives, and I was going to try and find, if I could get a hold of Camp David negotiations, that otherwise I couldn't find. You can pass it around, just as long as I get it back. And what I found was a whole slew of documents that were the Camp David negotiations, not only the memorandum of conversations that the Israelis had with the Americans, but it were memorandum of conversations that the Israelis had with one another. We don't have those kind of documents on the American side. We don't have the internal memorandum of the Americans. If they're available, they've never been published, and the US archivist who's in charge of publishing this material said, we tried to get them and the Carter Presidential Library wouldn't give them to us. Now, that's an entirely different question about why and source materials. So I walked away with, I don't know, uh, almost 200 pages of Xerox materials and the Israelis didn't care if I got a hold of them. They, you know, here, fine, go ahead, go translate, have a good time. You know, uh, swallow it all. And that's what I proceeded to do for the last three or four years, proceeded to start translating them. So these two new pieces of data have now become available. And I then proceeded to start spli splicing them together and I you know, would go back and I'd check myself and what did I get right and what did I get wrong and it was fun. It was like, who's, you'd rather correct yourself than have some crazy individual at, in, at some university who thinks they, they know the detail, you know, sort of writing a 500 word um, book review and ripping you apart, you'd rather do it yourself. Um, so I have proceeded to do that. Um, the diplomacy of the Arab-Israeli conflict, um, I learned when I wrote this, a lot of it was what I have come to call American-centric. That is to say, most of the information that we get about what happened between 73 and 79 comes from American authors and comes from principals who participated in the political process, Cyrus Vance, the Secretary of State, Zbigniew Brzezinski, the National Security Advisor, Jimmy Carter in his own memoir, Keeping Faith, and then something he wrote later on in 2010 and 11 called White House Diary. They all seem to reflect the same point of view that even though a comprehensive peace was not achieved, we could sell it as a comprehensive agreement because it was the effort that we put into it that mattered. Or you would read in these four individual, their memoirs, you would read about um, their conviction that it was Begin and his intransigence that 
kept an agreement from reaching conclusion. And you would read this over and over again. And it's what I learned in the 80s and in the 90s. And then I proceeded to see the memorandum of conversations between the Israelis and between the Israelis and the Americans, and I learned a whole new series of findings. Findings that clearly stated it wasn't that the Americans didn't know what the Israeli point of view was, because Dayan had explained it in October of 77 when he had come to Washington. He said, we're not going to apply Resolution 242 to the territories. We're not going to withdraw from the territories, except to very, perhaps, specific areas where there'll be, our military will reside. We're not going to stop settlements. We can assure you of that. And we will absolutely not allow an independent Palestinian state or Palestinian self-determination to emerge there. And when you look at those four or five and you say, well, that was Dayan and that was Begin in October 77, how, real, how different was that really from Labor and Rabin before May of 77, before the Mapach? And you realize there wasn't a great difference. So you, you then begin to understand that the Americans had a view that said, we are going to reach a comprehensive agreement even if Menachem Begin is, is, is prime minister, even if these are the four or five red lines that the Israelis will not cross. And these were the four or five red lines that the Israelis didn't cross when Camp David ended either. So it's not as if these were new viewpoints. These were reinforced viewpoints. And I've now looked, then I looked at some other secondhand material, secondary sources. Bill Quant wrote a book on Camp David. Um, a fellow by the name of uh, Lawrence Saunders wrote a book uh, on 13 days. Um, um, most recently, Stu Eisenstadt, who had been Jimmy Carter's um, domestic affairs advisor, wrote 600 or 700 page tome in which 180 pages are devoted to Camp David and the Middle East negotiations. And Stu himself had no role to play in them. He only was reporting what other people had told him. So it's really secondary information. Some of it is good. Some of it is, is not to be discounted. But he wasn't there. He's only reporting what he read from memoirs, including the memoirs of Weizmann and Dayan, who also wrote quite um, extensively about their, their times at, at, at Camp David. There were also a series of conferences that, that took place in the 80s and 90s that commemorated Sadat's visit to Jerusalem, uh, that took a look at 25 years after Camp David. Um, and a lot of those essays wonderfully written, presented, are digitally saved, they're on tape, and you can pick them up and you, you, you can get them. Um, do these remarks or do these findings suggest that Jimmy Carter was not as important as we have made him out to be? I think the answer is yes, and I will try and explain a little bit further along. Not to say that Carter was not important and that bringing him to Camp David was not vital, um, but I don't think it was critical. I don't think it was critical because I think both Begin and Sadat, um, and particularly um, Begin, Dayan, and Weitzman, and Sadat, uh, Begin, Weitzman, um, Dayan understood that they were not going to leave Camp David without an agreement. And they knew that on September 6th, because Sadat told Weitzman that. He said, we're not leaving until we get an agreement over Sinai. I have to tell you right now, you will have to leave uh, Sinai, and you'll have to leave the settlements. An agreement is possible. And Sadat said it to Carter. So they already knew pretty much what this outline might look like. It was going to be difficult to get to the outline. It wasn't pre-cooked, it wasn't pre-arranged, but they already had in their minds what it might look like. Um, and we know from around the 6th or 7th of September 
The Camp David Accords started on the 5th. We know around the 6th or 7th of September that Weizmann and Sadat were already talking about two separate agreements from Camp David, two frameworks. Um, one would be the Egyptian-Israeli one, one would deal with um, the territories. Um, the other, and most, there was a book by um, uh, uh, Gerald Streif on um, Jimmy Carter and foreign policy, and it came out about two or three years ago, it was quite good. Surprisingly enough, the best book that was written was written in 78 and 79 by um, Eitan Haber, um, Zev Schiff. Um, and um, Eitan Haber, Zev Schiff, and, and Ehud Yari, A Year of the Dove. And when I read it, after reading these minutes, I said, holy Hannah, what? They, get it, they got it right. And what I realized was they had access to all this when they wrote their book in 78, 79 and never used a footnote. And it still stands the test of time as being one of the very best renditions of what happened in that uh, period. Um, and lastly, I think what I've learned um, in, in, from these new documents and is just how critical, how absolutely essential, uh, how necessary um, three people were to have an agreement, namely Begin, Carter, and Sadat, but the absolute essential person to have an agreement go from beginning to end was Sadat. And if you want to hear and read what I think is one of the best articles written about Sadat and who he was and the context of the change that he brought to Egypt after Nasser is an article that Shimon Shamir wrote and presented at a conference at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy in um, 1997, I believe. It's worth everyone, you go find it online, it's worth reading. Um, I think um, Professor Shamir has done a, a masterful job in summarizing what most people have not been, and I'm not saying it because Shimon's here, I'm, I, I, I got a hold of the tapes of these conferences, and this is what I listen to in the car. Right? This, I, this is, I don't listen to Mary Chapin Carpenter, and I don't listen to Bruce Springsteen, and I don't listen to a nut Cohen. Sorry, Bruce. Um, I, you know, this is, when I drive to Charleston, this is what I put in, and this is what I listen. And I've listened to some of these over and over again, because some of them are just wonderful. Um, and, Moshe Dayan was quite clear to Sadat when he saw him for the first time around the 14th or 15th of September. He said, Mr. Mr. President, we the Israelis do not want your land. We absolutely don't want it. What we want is an agreement with you. And that's necessary for us. And I think an agreement is necessary for you. So it was really a trilateral kind of negotiations that were going on. Carter would have it with the Israelis, um, or Carter, Vance, Mondale, Brzezinski would have it with the Israelis, and Carter, Mondale, Vance, Brzezinski would have it with the Egyptians, and um, then the Israelis would have their own meetings between one another. I'd love to be able to get a hold of Egyptian materials on Camp David. I'm not even certain that most, a lot of it exists. I know Sadat did a lot of interviews in newspapers in 78, 79, and 80 before his assassination in October of, uh, of 81. But we don't have that body of, of, of literature. Maybe we, we will at, at some point. What did we learn about from these materials? What did I learn? Um, I think one, it's important to say that Sadat and Begin had a similar interest. Um, they wanted to preserve and build their respective relationship with Washington. They did not want to be blamed for a failure at Camp David. Um, they wanted to be sure that if there were a failure that they could explain it. Um, I think 
I learned that there's something deeply ingrained, was deeply ingrained in the Carter administration, it probably has been in other administrations since. It's what I call American exceptionalism, and that is the, an American naivete by administration leadership, uh, that if they think that there's a way of solving a problem, all you have to do is take the solution to the problem, apply logic, and the respective sides will come along because it makes sense for them to do so. Um, and it was just proven simply that um, the idea that you could somehow reach a comprehensive peace and you could impose it on the region, and if Brzezinski and Carter and Vance were ready, then the region would be ready. Um, and, and that proved to be totally false. It was a, 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 a total, it was totally illogical. Um, and that in part had to do with the lack of knowledge on the part of the American administration or this particular administration, on what Arab politics was all about, on how Arab politics worked, on what the interaction was between Arab leaders. Uh, there was um, a belief that if Sadat said he could represent the Jordanians, then he would represent the Jordanians. And the Americans said, fine, then if, if the Jordanians don't want to participate in Camp David and the Palestinians don't want to participate, then Sadat can re represent them all and that would be fine. And Brzezinski and Vance, and Carter and Quant believed it. Quant should have known better because he was a Middle Eastern specialist, but he just went along with this, the flow and the pull that essentially said that a comprehensive peace was doable. It wasn't doable. And Brzezinski himself in March of 79, in a meeting that he has with um, uh, Saudi Prince Fahad, he acknowledges the following. Now, this is Brzezinski in March of 79. It's six months after the Camp David Accords have been signed, but 10 days before the treaty will be signed. Brzezinski says the following to Saud and the White House. We have, through experience, come to understand that any attempt to solve all of the problems at once would simply mean that nothing gets solved. Frankly, we started with a different idea, but we, Carter, Vance, and Brzezinski discovered painfully that it would not work. I have now learned with some pain that even getting two parties together at this stage is, are, is extremely difficult. To try and add in other parties would guarantee failure and a continuation of the status quo. Uh, you know, that's hindsight, but that's not when you get there. Get there, you get there and you're excited about being the national security advisor to the president of the United States. You've come out of a planning session in 1975 at a think tank in Washington where they published something called the Brookings Institution paper which essentially says Israeli withdrawal to the territories taken in 67 with minor modifications, recognition of the territorial integrity and respect for the independence of all the states in the region and all of the right phraseology that you would otherwise find in Resolution 242. And what they realize is that this American exceptionalism proved to be inept, inaccurate, and wrong. And as I will say in a moment, I might as well say it now, that one of the great shortcomings of this agreement between Sadat and, and Begin, and one of the, the greatest fallouts from the negotiations that took place was this, the absolute total souring, and I mean total souring, of relations between the United States and King Hussein of Jordan. It was visceral, it was angry, and Brzezinski himself exacerbated it by going to Amman and telling the king, I only have an hour for you and then I have to go on to see Sadat. What a stupid thing for him to say to the, the, the person who was in, in charge of, 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 of uh, King Hussein's protocol. This whole story is related by the US ambassador to Amman at the time, a fellow who had served here in Israel previously, Nicholas Veliotis. And Ve Veliotis just ripped, just ripped Brzezinski apart for his ineptitude as a diplomat. Um, 
Carter believed that the other Arab partners would come along. He flirted with the PLO in March, April, May, June, July of 1977, and Arafat just kept on making promises, didn't deliver them. And Carter felt that, okay, so a comprehensive peace can't be reached because the Syrians aren't coming along and the PLO is not coming along. We can still reach a comprehensive peace and we can let Anwar Sadat do it for us. But they didn't realize every time they asked Sadat to do something for them, they were isolating him more because he needed a cover. He needed a fig leaf. He needed something that was going to say, yes, the Israelis are prepared to do this or that or whatever it is on the West Bank. And Sadat never got a fig leaf. And Brzezinski and Carter didn't understand that. They didn't understand how rough it was for Sadat after going to Jerusalem and how rough it was after signing the Camp David Accords that the Americans essentially left Sadat hanging. Um, I also learned, and others have pointed this out, is just how individual Sadat was in his own delegation. He didn't trust Osama, I mean, he trusted Osama al-Baz in the sense that he was a good draftsman, but he never allowed Osama really to enter into the key decision-making. Mohammed Ibrahim Kamal, the foreign minister, um, uh, Nabil Arabi, a member of the foreign ministry, uh, and others, Butrus Ghali, they were incidental pawns on the decision-making board for Sadat. Sadat was going to make all the key decisions and the Israelis knew it and the Americans knew it. And as Mohammed Kamal writes in his own book, he is, he's quoting Nabil Arabi, but he's quoting Nabil Arabi in, in the sense of, of, of Sadat berating him and saying, you people in the foreign ministry have no idea what's going on. You don't know how policy is made. You don't have any idea what I'm trying to do. There's no sense me even listening to you. So I just am not going to pay any attention to you. Well, that's not real good if you're a member of the, the Egyptian delegation um, at, um, uh, at, at Camp David. Um, the Carter administration had no idea about inter-Arab politics within the Palestinian Arab community. They had no idea how Arafat had used um, violence and threats against Palestinians in the territories in the 1972 and the 1976 municipal elections. No clue. And it, it's as if to say they came to office and they didn't care about contemporary Middle Eastern politics. It had no relevance to their view of the outcome that they wanted. Um, I did not know how dependent Jimmy Carter was on Zbigniew Brzezinski. I had no clue that when Carter ran for office, how fully unaware he was of foreign affairs. Brzezinski arranged for people to fly down to Plains, Georgia in 75 and 76 and give Carter half-day seminars on arms control and and, and the Panama Canal Treaty and health care and the Middle East. Brzezinski loved being Carter's tutor. And therefore, he also loved being highly influential in, making, in helping Carter make his decisions. And Brzezinski made no bones about his dislike of American Jews in the political process. Um, Two examples, one, a personal interview that I did with him for my book. I asked Zabig flat out in 1992. I said, by then I had come to know a lot of these people on a first name basis because I had met them through Carter and been in Washington. I said, Zabig, so why do you suppose the American Jewish community disliked you so much? Oh, Ken, come on, that's pretty obvious. I'm Catholic and I'm Polish, was his response. I mean, how more direct do you want him to be? And then you read his memoirs and you read the stories about the plane deal in February to May of 1978, the Egyptian, Saudi, um, uh, Israeli arms deal, the, the package deal, 
and you realize that Brzezinski had meetings with the American Jewish community, and they came in and they talked to Brzezinski and they said, you know this is an offensive weapon, it's not a defensive weapon, you know you shouldn't be doing this. And Brzezinski got up from his chair, he pointed his finger at one of the leaders of the American Jewish community and he said, you have to decide, are you American or are you Jewish? You can't be both. And he stomped out of the room. Now, you know, you, you're a member of, a, of, a, of a, an American Jewish delegation that's sitting there next to Brzezinski and you go out of the room and you tell your wife or you tell your, the people who work in your office and all of a sudden it's, Brzezinski is out to get us. Well, it wasn't the only example of the Carter administration not being uh, friendly uh, toward Jews and toward um, Israel. And here I make a distinction, I think, between Jews and Israel. The, is, the, the anti-Jewish one, Carter, had, um, had only evolved in the, uh, after he came to office. He, he ran for office on a, uh, clearly on a, on a series of planks in the Democratic platform that said, I'm not going to sell weapons um, uh, to the Arabs. I'm not going to sell Israel uh, out um, to, to acquire oil. Um, I'm not going to put pressure on the state of Israel. He said all these things in public as he ran for office, and as soon as he came to office, of course, he turned the switch off and he went the other way, which, you know, that's American politics. I get it. I understand it. Um, but the point of it is when people run for office, um, just, let's just beware. And I, you know, personally, I didn't know how headstrong Carter was and um, how... Uh, antagonistic he was toward Israel and the territories and Begin until he published. Um, I mean, I knew working with him from 81 and 82 when he left the White House in a rather you know, regular way until 93. I was still at Emory. I still taught, but I was a Middle East fellow of the Carter Center. Um, but I didn't realize until he published his book, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid, in 2006, just how much anger there was within him. I mean, there was real anger within him about Israel, and Israel's responsible for just about anything. And I came to know that because I was the guy who took the minutes at meetings with, with Assad and Mubarak and with Begin and King Hussein, and then Carter turned around and completely doctored those minutes to make it look like Israel was at fault and these respective countries were not. Not to say that the Israelis are not at fault at all. This is not a whitewash for the Israelis. And I wrote my summary of Carter's book in a, an article which appeared in Middle East Forum in 2007, if you're interested. Um, I want to say one more word about um, sourcing. Carter wrote in 2011, something called White House Diary, which is a compilation of his recollections when he was in the White House of things that happened on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, he had this journal which he kept. The problem with using this as a source is that Carter publishes in this book, White House Journal, only the passages that he wants you to read. It's not a full transcript. It's not a full manuscript of what was there at a particular time on a particular issue. So he has already summarized, abbreviated, and truncated for the reader. And it's even more angry than his memoir in 1983, Keeping Faith. I mean, you sit there and you read them closely if you're, you know, you're interested in historiography, you make some, make sort of, some sort of comparisons like this. Um, and I learned when I used these that there were 90 minutes at camp, 90 different minutes, 90 different meetings that took place at Camp David. 90. The US government has 18 of the minutes online. And all of those 18 are summaries. None of them are full transcripts. Which means 75% are not available in English. 
Now you add the 38 or 40 that I got from the Israelis, I'm still missing a half. Now, the problem with the Israeli transcripts is that the notes were taken in English. I mean, the notes were presented in English, but the notes were taken in Hebrew. Or so the person like Eli Rubenstein, who was taking notes, or Simcha Dinitz, who was taking notes, is listening in Hebrew, and then he's translating into English. And how do you know that his translation from the Hebrew to the English is an accurate translation of what actually transpired between Begin and Sadat, and uh, between Begin and Weitzman, and, 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 and Dinitz, and Aaron Barak, and wh whoever else was in the, the Israeli delegation. Those Israeli delegation minutes are online. They're easily accessible as soon as you leave the room on the Israel State Archives. I suggest you have a look, because they really are fascinating to see how the Israelis tried to understand what Sadat wanted and understood that the Americans were trying to take the Israelis to a place that even Sadat didn't want the Israelis to go. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the, the, the run for the presidency. Um, let me tell you about this story about Roy Atherton. Atherton, after Camp David ended, he and Cy Vance and Hal Saunders were detailed to go to the Middle East to explain the Camp David Accords to Arab leaders. And he was told um, that he should go to the region and explain that the, Ameri that the Americans and Carter's promise that settlements would be halted for five years was what Begin promised. And Atherton was told that by Brzezinski the morning he left on this trip. Brzezinski turns to me in the interview and he said, Ken, I want this for the record. I want you to know that that day Brzezinski came to me and he gave me a piece of paper. And on that piece of paper he wrote, you have a promise from the United States that the Israelis will halt their settlements for five years. Now, that's not what happened the night before Camp David ended. A whole story about that, which we could go into probably till Shachari tomorrow morning, but it's not worth it. And he looked at me again, he said, Ken, did you get that story? Did you get this notion that Brzezinski gave me a piece of paper, what was his total invention, and I was supposed to show this to the Arab leaders? And later on, Hal Saunders, who worked with him, Hal Saunders said, it wasn't, it wasn't that we couldn't prevent the settlements, is that we promised them that we couldn't prevent them. That was the issue. That was the issue at hand. So they confounded their, what they thought they heard, with a promise that they couldn't keep, and then they reinforced it by sending out Vance and, 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 and Saunders and Atherton to the respective Arab leaders. And that created enormous rancor and anger and, well, you can imagine what it did. What did occur as a result of Camp David? One, it pulled Egypt closer to the U.S. and away from the Soviet Union. Two, I think it's fair to say it splintered the Arab world as never before. It was already splintering, but it continued, and it further isolated Egypt. We all know that because the Arab League then left Cairo and um, Egypt was sort of hanging out there like Pluto in the 80s. Three, it fully, fully alienated King Hussein. And I sensed that when I was in Amman in 1983 with Jimmy Carter and we went to visit the king and we were invited to dinner and Carter was expecting to sit next to the king and the king intentionally left the seat next to himself empty. But well, what greater snub could you have put on Carter? 
Syria upped its involvement with Moscow to better its national interest. I think six, it prompted Israel to focus more intently on its other borders. It gave Israel virtually unimpeded prerogative to do what it wanted with West Bank, Gaza, Golan, and Jerusalem. Um, it certainly maintained the disagreement between Washington and Jerusalem on how to manage the territories. Nine, it diluted some undisclosed of amount of American foreign policy attention away from Iranian events. Now, this gets to be pretty testy and pretty cloudy because it was the end of 1978 that we begin to hear and see the dramatic unfolding of the Shah in Iran losing grip or control. To what degree did the American administration focus their attention on what was going on in the Egyptian-Israeli theater? What impact that might that have had on decision makers, on people's attention span? I can't speak to it. I've never gone into it. I just know I've talked to one person who was um, uh, working the Iran desk at the time, and he is thoroughly convinced that um, things might have been different without really telling me exactly what that meant. But that's all pure speculation. Um, I think what's clear is that this negotiation showed that experienced bureaucracies, namely the Americans, and experienced bureaucrats, namely the Israelis, could dominate the writing of an agreement. I think the Israelis clearly outclassed the Egyptians at Camp David in terms of their legalistic, um, in, in terms of their, their crafting and their drafting abilities. Um, what did Camp David not accomplish? Um, this was a transaction. It was not a transformation of Egyptian attitudes or Arab attitudes toward Israel. No comprehensive negotiations evolved. This was not a comprehensive peace, as the Carter administration would have us believe. Um, and how do we know it wasn't comprehensive? And how do we know it was um, another disengagement agreement, if you don't mind me saying that? And this is what Hal Saunders said, and I will end with this. Hal said this in, in an interview. Hal Saunders, again, had worked at the State Department and had been a key draftsman of the Camp David Accords. Saunders writes, for me, the tensest moment came at the White House as the accords were to be signed Sunday night. I knew how deeply troubled the Egyptian, wa Egyptian team was, and I'm sure Sadat felt a lot like that. At the very end of our time at Camp David, around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, um, um, let's see, around 4 o'clock Sunday afternoon, Carter met with Sadat, and I'd been called over to Carter's lodge. When I walked in, I saw Carter and Sadat coming down the hall, from Carter's study. I stepped aside as they said goodbye to each other. Carter turned away from the door and said, I think we have an agreement, but I was afraid to ask him. At four o'clock in the afternoon, they're going to sign this at 10.30 at night. Indeed, there came to be an agreement, but on Sunday evening, right before the signing ceremony, Carter asked me to come in and show everybody the actual copies that were being signed. There were two documents. The framework for peace, I can't get this to work right, the framework for peace um, uh, that had to be signed uh, by everybody. And Carter said, I want you to do it this way. I want you, please, to take the framework for peace in the Middle East and have it signed first. Then I want you to have the agreement, the, the peace accord between Egypt and Israel signed second. He then looked at me as if he would kill me if his instructions were not followed to the letter. He told me that President Sadat insisted on that scenario. That told me and others that Sadat knew that he would be accused of, by the Arab world of getting the Sinai back for Egypt, but getting only a very vague agreement for everyone else, especially the Palestinians. By demanding that sequence, Sadat was singling that the framework of importance to the Palestinians, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon came first and that the Egyptian-Israeli framework came second. But we all knew at Camp David it was just the opposite. Now, when you go through minutes, go through documents, you get a, a sense of what transpired. You get a sense of the detail. And it's digging a very deep hole and digging, a, I think, a wide hole. But I think I've learned that it was a good idea to have done this book using oral sources. 
I think it's even a better idea now for me to be able to go back and compare what I did then and what I'm doing now. Um, there's a lot more to discuss. I'll leave it at that. I'll be glad to take your questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ken. Uh, I think it was, I think uh, Eli Kaduri wrote uh, once that uh, diplomatic history was a record of what one uh, bureaucrat clerk uh, wrote to another uh, bureaucratic, uh, a bureaucrat or clerk. Uh, he didn't say that uh, in, a, in a negative way. And in fact, I think that we, what we've heard again here today is what we've, uh, what we've heard and what Ken has shown is that diplomatic history is really exciting. Uh, and in our field, so, uh, diplomatic history has been belittled for so long in favor of all kinds of other ways of, of writing history. And I say that all ways are legitimate if they're done well. Uh, diplomatic history. I think, as we've seen, is very, very exciting, um, and uh, and uh, there's always more to be said. I look, we look forward to uh, the the revised version of heroic diplomacy based on your research, Ken. Uh, and uh, I'd like to open it up now for questions, and uh, perhaps uh, we can begin with uh, with, with our students if there are questions or comments. Let me just quickly run through some photographs, which many of you may not have seen. Okay. Um, these were all um, acquired. Um, um, I think I'm going to get this right. So this is Sadat, Begin, Tahila, and Weitzman. Uh, this is Carter, Weitzman, Begin, and Dan Patir. Um, Mrs. Begin, of course, Jimmy Carter. Um, Begin, Dinitz, Kadishai, and Patir. Uh, those two you recognize. Weitzman and Diane on the way to uh, a meeting with Carter. This is Shabbos at Camp David. Um, and uh, look at Carter's eyes, and you don't know if you can recognize it, but he does have a kippah on. Um, this is, I think, the Israelis were singing something which Carter couldn't know or understand, but apparently his rhythm was reasonable. Um, Shalom, you all, which is typical of the American South. This is the day that they went to camp. This they went to, to Gettysburg for a day. And um, the interesting vignette about that ride to Gettysburg is in the ride to Gettysburg in the back of the car, Carter had told Begin and Sadat that no one is going to talk about politics today. So Begin sat in one side, Carter in the middle, and Sadat in the other. And Begin never said a word. They got to Camp Dave, they got to Gettysburg. And the Rangers started explaining about the, the, the war and how, tragedy, how, how tragic it was. And at one point, Begin turns to uh, Carter and says, Mr. President, may I have the floor? And then Begin proceeds to recite the entire Gettysburg Address by heart, which is only Begin, right? Um, this is um, Osama al-Baz um, Sadat. Um, this is the famous Vice President Tuhami on the right-hand side. Um, I, I, have not yet been able to make out the back of that person. I'm not familiar with Egyptian backs, um, but I, I guess I'll learn. Huh? maybe? I don't know. Weitzman, Sadat, Abrasha Tamir, Kadishai, Eli Rubinstein, Aram Barak, um, Begin. Um, you know, this is Diane. This is the drafting of Brzezinski and Vance. This is the draft team with the Egyptians, Osama El Baz, Vance, Sadat, and of course Carter. Um, and the way the agreement ultimately was put together was that Carter would get Osama El Baz, would bring Osama El Baz and Barack together, and they would work on the drafting, the detailed drafting of each word. And when you get down to 15, 16, 17 of of the, the minutes of the meetings, you get to see how detailed these discussions were and how each word mattered. Um, and uh, Barack was, um, I think, to say he was a hero would be an understatement. He was interviewed at, uh, at the Israel State Archives about 40 years. And um, the lady who interviewed him said, so what is your general, out view, your general view about 
the minutes of these meetings and all the discussion, and he said, he, he said in Hebrew, Kol Echad Yesh Camp David Shalom. Translate for our international students? Um, everyone has their own Camp David. <laughs> so, you know, that, I guess that's the case when you have oral history. Everyone has their own recollections and their own memories. And here is Barak himself who had been there, and, you know, he's reading his, his own minutes. So there's, there's a lot to be learned from these minutes. There's a lot to be cautious about the minutes and how they're used. Um, but it's a fascinating glimpse of what transpired. And again, I say my number one conclusion was, as I learned in writing the book, that Sadat was the engine. Sadat kept the engine going in 74, 75. Um, he was not particularly sad when Begin was elected president or uh, prime minister. Um, Mubarak apparently um, woke him up that morning and said, Mr. President, I don't have such good news for you. Um, the Israelis have elected um, uh, someone from the Likud. They haven't elected labor. They elected Menachem Begin, and it's really not good news for us. And um, Sadat, according to the story told to me by Dan Patir, who was the media person in charge of, um, uh, for, for Begin at Camp David, and he also had worked for Rabin, um, Sadat apparently turned to Mubarak and said, Husni, what are you talking about? That's great news. Because now that I know the Israelis won't focus on the West Bank of Jerusalem, they'll only focus on Sinai. Smart guy, right? Anyway, so thank you for the interlude. I'm sorry to interrupt. In the lecture, um, I have actually two questions. I assume that the Egyptian archive of uh, sure. the records of this uh, negotiation is not available. Is that, is that to my knowledge, um, I have not. Um, I've not inquired. I've not um, asked a colleague or friend. Um, I, I don't believe they are, but I may be wrong. Yeah. They're not open, so. They may exist, but they're not open. You think they exist? They, yeah, they would exist, yeah. The second, yeah. second question is if they were. Um, that's a great question. Um, I, I can't anticipate what I haven't seen. <laughs> um, I don't think I would find too many things that would be different. I think I might find the depth and magnitude of the irritation that the Egyptian delegation had towards Sadat for not being participants in the decision-making process. I might have learned, I might learn if if there was a discussion between Butrus Ghali and Muhammad Ibrahim Kamal and Nabil Arabi, you know, key figures at Camp David in the Egyptian delegation, I think I might learn um, just how much dislike they had for even being there. I didn't realize that after reading a couple of the memoirs in English, that it wasn't just the dislike that the Egyptians had, the Egyptian delegation had for the Israelis. It was a distaste. It wasn't just a dislike. It was something deeper than that. It wasn't like, oh, we're, okay, we'll make an agreement with you. We still don't like you. You're not doing what we want you to do for the Palestinians of self-determination. Osama al-Baz, when he came to Israel on several occasions with Sadat after the peace treaty, was signed. He would always isolate himself. He would not want to be with the Israelis. He just didn't like being in their presence. And when I saw him with President Carter in 1987 in Cairo, I actually asked him, I said, so what was it about the Israelis? He said, I just can't stomach the state of Israel. I can't stomach its very existence. And I'll tell you one more thing, he said. If Sadat had made a bigger deal about the settlements, maybe Carter would have made a bigger deal. But Sadat wasn't going to make a bigger deal because he needed Sinai back. And after March of 79, our entire focus, says Osama al baz was being sure that the Sinai was returned, that the peace treaty was implemented to its fullest. I mean, is it a case of a bureaucrat working for a leader 
remorseful that he had to and telling you just what his real feelings were inside. Now this was 87, this was nine years later. I don't think he would have forgotten that deep feeling. I think the first distinction would have to be made is the Israelis live here and the Americans don't. And so they don't really have an understanding of the geography or the topography or the Jordan River Valley. I think that's part of it. I think the second was that Begin replicated to some degree the attitude held by some members of the Israeli military, and particularly Dayan, who is now his foreign minister, that believed that a a Palestinian state in the West Bank would ultimately be a threat to the state of Israel because then there would be borders and then there would be someone else who would be controlling this land and that would not be in Israel's interest. Um, and I think with Begin also, there was the overlay, of course, of the ideology of this is Judea and Samaria, this is the ancient homeland of the Jewish people. Um, and I think he, Begin, very early on in his administration, um, agreed with Dayan, or, or whether Dayan agreed with him or he agreed with Dayan, I don't remember exactly how it happened, was that no foreign sovereignty would be allowed to be applied to Judea and Samaria and the West Bank. That it would have to be left open. And if there was ever an effort to try and put that sovereignty under someone else's control, at Camp David we learn, because the Israelis talked about this themselves, then we will put forth our own claim for sovereignty. And the Israelis said, if we put forth our own claim for sovereignty, then we will end the Camp David Accords, we will end the Camp David negotiations prematurely. So we don't want to do that now. We might want to do that after the accords are signed. So it's, it's trying to put a key in a keyhole and do it very gingerly without breaking the lock or breaking the key. Um, and the Americans understood that this, this was what the Israelis were maneuvering in and between and around. Um, I don't think there's any doubt that Carter and Brzezinski understood it. I don't think there's any doubt at all. It's a good question. It's a good question. And, you know, no one could, no one could test the Israelis because the Palestinians were absolutely uh, uncompromising in their willingness to even think about the prospects of recognizing Resolution 242 or renouncing terrorism. Um, and and you know, so the Israelis were never confronted with that reality. I mean, supposing Sadat had said yes to Carter's overtures, supposing he had said, sure, I'll come to Camp David. I mean, well, <laughs> you imagine how the whole scenario would have changed or unfolded. But the Israelis knew that Arafat and his organization were so divided internally and that Arafat was so intent on keeping control of the organization that he could not even begin to think about the possibility of, of tacking toward maybe an accommodation. Such a thorough example of a misunderstanding of the U.S. administration of how the Palestinian community worked. It was, and I would say that American presidents have made similar mistakes since. And this notion that somehow if you want it, it's going to happen. And that's different from what I would like to see happen, but it's the reality that's on the ground. Question? Yeah. Um, I'm 
Dr. Phil Winter from the Institute uh, INSS. Welcome, thank you. I, I love your writings, by the way. So let me take this one and then we'll, you know. Um, You're too young to forget the second question, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, you, you, can, you can transfer it to me because I'm not too young. Um, I, this is a conclusion that I didn't reach, I didn't give you as to what what we learn about contemporary negotiations. And one of them is that you reach an agreement because national interests are served. Clear, defined national interests. They don't have to be the same national interests, but they, they have to be clearly defined. And the other part of, of that is each side has to be able to make political trade-offs in order to even get to that point of um, of recognize the other's national interest. No one had any doubt whose sign I belonged to. No one had any doubt that um, the settlements were, you know, didn't belong there. Um, I mean, Begin could have argued it, but ultimately the Knesset said, you know, they're out of here. And that's what the Knesset voted. So I think the lesson here is that the national interest continued to be served because of geography and proximity. Um, and those are important lessons. You don't change geography. You know, you know, same geography during the Mamluks. I mean, the same geography during the Ottomans. The geography's geography. Oh, okay, maybe the Suez Canal is additional, but so I, I think um, I think if you asked Sisi today, I know he's beginning to make noises like uh, there might be some changes and uh, maybe he's not as sanguine about his relationship with the State of Israel. But I think. By and large, he understands that he needs a friend on the other side of Sinai. I, I hate, I mean, that probably doesn't fit very well with people who do political theory and they have all these, you know, great formulas and, and, quote, and, and equations that prove these kinds of things, but it, it's pretty simple. It's national interest. My second question. <laughs> Can we go for a beer? <laughs> I mean, you don't really think I have the capacity to answer that question, do you? I mean, in all seriousness. Um, I, I don't know what America's role is in the world. I mean, I, I, I simply can't. There's, there's, it's, not a defined, it's not a defined phrase. It's not a defined ethos. It's not a defined doctrine. I mean, usually, you know, since World War II, we've had presidents who have doctrines. You know, you don't like the Nixon doctrine, like Carter doctrine, Reagan doctrine, Obama. I don't care what it, but we've had things that you could put your finger on and, you know, move from side to side. Not sure I know what this is. I'm not sure I know what this is. Um, so I, I would be cautious about trying to make any estimate, and I'd be cautious about trying to make a foreign policy predicated on what this man's going to say in tomorrow morning's tweet. I, I, I ran away from an answer. I mean, clearly I ran away. Yeah, Mayor. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Thanks, Ken. It was very interesting. Clarified a number of points, especially the issue of the so-called promise uh, to free settlement. Reminded me in a few years after uh, uh, after the Camp David Agreement, uh, a group of us, the Janssen there people, had breakfast with Carter in New York, and uh, we were expecting him, you know, to have some 
perspective, more composed <coughs> with his remarks. And the anger he expressed personally on Dagen. At Dagen. At Dagen. He promised me that he will free the city. For five years. And he couldn't, he couldn't really uh, leave that point. We were really shocked by this. No, he, and he never left it. Yeah. You're right. And I remember, I think I was maybe the person who arranged for that. I think you and Itamar and Asher yeah, were there, right, and, right. right? The other usual suspects. You were present that? Yeah, I think I arranged it, actually. And how would you evaluate the, the <laughs> promise or, uh, his, historically? Was there such anything? Why did Carter, mis, not, uh, why did Carter mis, misinterpret so badly what, what, he, what, Bacon, what Bacon and his others were telling you? Um, That's my understanding. No, I, I, I'll take a couple minutes. It's, it's, it's much longer. And the, the data for this comes from Aaron Barak's own notes of the meeting that night. He was the only one who... Let me just, let me just I'm sorry. Aaron Barak was, at the time, the uh, Attorney General. About to be Supreme, Supreme Court, Court Justice. And who later became the Chief of the Israeli Supreme Court, considered to be one of the great jurists of, of his generation in, in Israeli law and international law in general. Yeah. So Barak had notes. And Barak, immediately after um, the accords, he... he he, he gave his notes to Begin, they were translated, no, <laughs> they were translated into English and then sent to Carter and essentially said that, essentially said that um, um, the promise, Carter had said that afternoon before they left Camp David, I think we have an agreement, I think we have an agreement on five years. Um, and Vance said to Carter, I'm not certain I heard that in the afternoon. Um, and what happened was they got to the signing on the evening of the 17th. And immediately after the signing, Begin went home or went to wherever he was staying in Washington. Um, Carter met Sadat the next morning. And the information from this comes from the U.S. ambassador to Egypt, a man by the name of Herman Eilts, E-I-L-T-S, and the American ambassador to the United States, I'm sorry, the American ambassador to Israel, Samuel Lewis. American ambassador to Israel, Samuel Lewis. And they both agree on what happened next. They both agree that on a morning walk or a morning meeting that Carter said to Sadat, I have a promise for five years. And that afternoon, Carter gave an address to the joint session of Congress announcing the Camp David Accord results in which he said we have a promise um, on a moratorium on settlements for the duration of the negotiations on the territories. For a permanent settlement. For a permanent settlement. Which was not the case. Um, and Sam Lewis recollects, he said, I remember Carter immediately after he received the letter from Begin that said his promise was for a moratorium for three months. I remember Carter turning to the Assistant Secretary of State, Hal Saunders, and said, Hal, this is not the right letter. Get me the right letter. And this is confirmed by Roy Atherton and confirmed by other people who were part of the diplomatic delegation at the time, independently told me I had, they weren't all in the room together. It was all independently gleaned from them. Get me the right letter. And Saunders went to Dinitz at the, America, at the Israel uh, Embassy in Washington, and Dinitz said, this is the letter you're going to get. And a couple of days later, Sadat was interviewed. I don't know whether he was still in the United States or he was back in Egypt. Someone said, so what do you think about the settlements? He said, I don't care about the settlements. Sadat said it. 
I don't care about the settlements, which of course the Israelis immediately seized on as, look, if the Egyptian leader doesn't care about the settlement, why is Carter so upset about these? Why was Carter so upset about the settlements? Because for Carter, the settlements were an, an obstacle to the creation of an independent Palestinian state. They were an obstacle to Israel's withdrawal from the West Bank to specified areas that could be devolved ultimately into a Palestinian state. The settlements kept the process from moving forward as far as Brzezinski and Carter and Vance were concerned in terms of reaching the comprehensive peace that would see a Palestinian state ultimately evolve. And how do you know that this was the American effort? Because if you look at the discussions between the Israelis and the Americans on September 14, 15, 16, and 17, minutes that are not in this, but are only in the Israeli minutes, you see just how hard the Americans tried to push the Israelis toward the devolution of a state in which Brzezinski actually said, my entire task at Camp David has been to try and take Begin's autonomy plan and turn it into a devolved, ultimately, Palestinian state in five years. He acknowledges it. Now, you don't get that from reading the American minutes, and you don't get it from reading the American memoirs. Now, what are we going to find when we get the Egyptian minutes? It's, you know, it's a layer cake, and you just keep on pulling off another layer. But that's what all history is revisionist history, guys. It all is. Because after I finish this, someone else will come along and do something you know, equally as interesting and fascinating. But in the meantime, I'm having a good time. Sure. Uh, question. There, is a, there was a claim in Israel that Begin did not really understand what he was signing. That what? That Begin did not really understand the full implications of what he had signed about the autonomy, that the autonomy could have evolved into a state. Or, by the way, after five years, the Palestinians would have claimed to be the most part of Israel. Shlomo Avineri wrote a horror story. I remember an article in uh, Maori so discussing a horror scenario where the Palestinians said one of the Israeli citizens. Not Who made this claim? Shlomo Avinari. This is a possibility, and why is dangerous for Israel? It would never appeared in Weitzman or Dayan's memoirs. Okay, keep going. I didn't say it didn't bring peace, I just said it was another disengagement agreement. Here I think I would disagree with you. Being a pessimist, I think it was, better. It was greater success than you, you can imagine. No, it was a success because March of 79 proved it was a success. Uh, I even go further. The fact that after the elections of the Muslim Brothers in Egypt in 2011, even Musi, an open anti Semite, did not revoke the peace treaty with Israel. Did not mention the name Israel, but did not revoke the peace treaty. And even a Nasserist like Amr Musa, again, viciously anti Israel, explained why the peace treaty with Israel is in Egyptian interest, shows you, in my view, that King David was a much stronger agreement than we had imagined. In fact, it did produce a change, as much as they disliked the Israel. You have the benefit of 2011. No. I'm only talking about 78, 79. No, no. Oh, if you, re if you want to evaluate it from 40 years, go back, to, go back to the question earlier, then of course you have to say it was a major success. It kept Israel and Egypt from going to war for 40 years. If, if Israel's goal was to buy time, this is the best timeshare Israel had. It didn't get any better than this. It doesn't get, and it, it survived an assassination. It survived Israel's invasion of Lebanon. It, it survived the attack of the Iraqi reactor. It, you know, it, there was a, there's a whole litany of things that it survived. It survived Morsi. I mean, think about it. 
it was, that's, quite, that's quite elastic. That's quite extraordinary for an agreement. But I think Dayan and Weitzman understood exactly what they were doing. I think Begin maybe less so as a strategist. Certainly Abrasha Tamir understood it at Camp David. They understood exactly what they were getting from the Egyptians in terms of having the Egyptians turn, take away one wheel off the wagon of war against Israel. Now, whether Begin understood it or not is not, you know, he, he was prime minister. I, I don't think it's fair to say that Begin didn't understand that his autonomy plan was clearly meant to be for the people and not for the land. I think it's absolutely crystal clear in the last three days of the Camp David negotiations that he made that case to Carter over and over again. How do you know it would have evolved? You're a historian. How do you know that? Well, I, you know, I, I don't know when, you know, did, did he decide to do that in the, in the end of 81? Did he tie, decide to do it before the invasion of Lebanon? I mean, now you're getting, look, I, I have great respect for Shlomo Avineri. I think he's one of the great political scientists of, of, of Israel in the 20th century, maybe in, into the 21st century. But from what I know from the minutes of the meeting, and maybe I'm too much of a devotee of the minutes of the meeting, the Israelis understood just how limited Palestinian political autonomy was then and what they were going to allow to have happen within five years. That's all. I think you should do yourself, you know, have some fun. Go to the State Ar 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 Archives tonight online and have some chocolate ice cream and chocolate sauce. One last question, Dr. Parker. Oh, no, not you again. Hi, Joe, how are you? Um, I, I think you have the minutes of the meeting from, um, uh, uh, right, that's the one from the September 17th where right. Carter meets uh, uh, so Dayan in the, billet, in, the billet, in the billet room or something? Yeah. Right? Exactly. Right. With, uh, yeah. Um, uh, Carter actually says to, to Vance, says actually, uh, I'm sorry, I start again. Dayan actually says to Carter, here we are at Camp David. The last day, and you're now bringing up Jerusalem? You want flags over Jerusalem? What do you want flags over Jerusalem for? And, and the day before, it had been discussed, and you know, Weitzman and, 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 and Dayan and, and Begin and Barak said, absolutely, no, you know, the flags aren't even possible. And Carter actually says in this meeting to, to Dayan, he says, this is occupied territory. This is occupied territory. And Dayan goes berserk. He said, occupied territory? Mount Scopus is occupied territory? The Jewish quarter is occupied territory? We're not talking about things that may be there for 2,000 years. We're talking about things that we purchased from the Arabs in the 20s and 30s. And we occupied it. Just because Abdullah comes in and takes it doesn't make it occupied. And Carter said, well, I made a promise to Sadat to say that Jerusalem, he had to have a, a statement on Jerusalem. This was the Saudis that were speaking to Carter. This wasn't Sadat who was speaking to Carter. This was Sadat turning to Carter saying, give me a fig leaf for the Saudis on Jerusalem. 
and the Israelis understood it. And they said, not on the last day of the camp. Dayan even goes so far as to say, if we had known that you were going to bring this up, if Jerusalem was going to be brought up, we would never have come here. Now, I don't know if Dayan was exaggerating. But the point of it is, here we are at the very end, and Dayan lashed out at the president. And Carter was nonplussed, didn't break, said, well, I have to have something I have to give to Sadat. Ultimately, what happened was the Americans wrote a letter, both to Begin and to the Egyptians, that said the American position on Jerusalem is, as it's been stated by our ambassadors at the UN in 1969, in 1968, 69, whatever, that we consider um, uh, Jerusalem or East Jerusalem be occupied territory. And Begin said, if that's the one, is that the letter they're going to send? That's fine. But they can't ask us to sign an agreement on, at Camp David that's going to say something about our control over Jerusalem. That's just not going to happen. I mean, the Israelis had real red lines. And Carter knew he was pushing and pushing and pushing. And he also knew the resistance and the resilience of the Israelis. And he found, found it out. I mean, what I like is the give and the take and the push and the shove and the yank and the promises. And I, mean, I think this would make a great movie. I think this would be a terrific movie. And then you have to figure out who you're going to cast as Sadat and Begin and Carter and Dion and Weitzman. Unfortunately, there aren't very many female characters in it. Thank you very much.